So I, I've been wanting to uh, think about the relationships between the three volumes of capital. Uh, in, of course, in the full understanding that volumes two and three were never completed and are only sketches in some, uh, some way. But Marx, at various times uh, in his uh, lifetime, was often invoking the idea of a totality. And therefore, it seemed important to me to sort of try to think about the totality of capital, uh, circulation, and accumulation. And taking the perspective of the totality to re then reflect back on some of the understandings that we have of the different segments of Marx's investigations of political economy, not only in the three volumes of Capital, but also in theories of surplus value and the various other economic writings. And in thinking about the totality, I was sort of suddenly struck by uh, this image you see uh, on the screen here, uh, which is a geographer I became very familiar with a very, very long time ago, which is what we call the water cycle or the hydrological cycle. And what struck me about it was that as a visualization, it actually raised all sorts of interesting kind of questions. And as a visualization, it also had about it some characteristics that seemed to me rather like capital, in the same way that capital in its circulation process undergoes certain metamorphoses of form. One minute it's a commodity, then it's production, then it's money, and then it's commodity again. So uh, in the water cycle, sometimes you're dealing with uh, liquid, sometimes you're dealing with a vapor, you're dealing then with different paths that the water takes, some of it moves fast, some of it moves very slow, some of it gets lost and locked up and you never see it again until somebody comes along and engages in global warming and sort of releases it all. So, so it seemed to me that this visualization was uh, very, very helpful for understanding uh, the circulation, the hydrological cycle, and certain aspects of, uh, of, of that. And it seemed to me that, well, maybe when we start to think about circulation, we should think about circulation of capital in very much the same way. But it is not the circulation of capital, however, that we're looking at, but the circulation of what Marx called value. And I don't have a really a great deal of time to sort of talk about uh, you know, exactly what's meant by value, but well, the definition of capital that I like is one where it's value in motion. And actually the motion is terribly important. When the motion stops, capital dies. So the existence of capital is dependent very much upon its motion. And as it moves, it goes through different states and it goes through different transformations. And so what I did was then to, to map this in a certain kind of way, and here's another technological hope that we can get this. <laughs> I don't know, is there some way to, to get, get the second? Of, does this do it? I think this is for recording. Hmm? This is for the recording. Well, will somebody put the second sl slide up? I'll have to go to the computer. Oh, it's over there. Okay, they told me it was going to be over here, but uh, just uh, well, just yeah, just well, the second one right now. <laughs> okay, we got it. Okay, all right, there it is. Yay! Here, okay, here is the uh, the slide, uh, which is about uh, the paths uh, that capital takes as it moves, and the best way to do is to start in the little black box at the bottom that says money capital, because Marx uh, in Volume One talks about the conversion of money into capital. Not all money is capital. Capital is money used in a certain way, and it is used by in the way that I describe here. It used first to buy commodities, uh, particularly labor power and means of production. Then labor power and means of production are brought together in a production process. And as Marx points out, th th this is a trans. This is a movement from the money form of value to the commodity form of value which then goes into the production form of, of activity of value. But the production is of two sorts, and this is, I think, crucial to always to understand when Marx uses the word production. First, it's the production of a tangible commodity, a, a use value of a certain kind, which will then be used in the market in a certain way. But it's also the production of value and surplus value. 
So it has this dual meaning, and therefore the commodity has to embody uh, value and surplus value, and, and value being socially necessary labor time, and about labor time, that is what is being congealed within the commodity in the production process. And that production process then produces a new commodity which has congealed within it a certain kind of, uh, of, of reference to human labor, that is the money, that is the, the, the socially necessary labor time. But that commodity is then taken to market and it is sold, or as Marx says, the value is realized uh, through the conversion of the commodity into the money form. And the act of, uh, of uh, realization takes place uh, in, in the market, uh, which then leads uh, to uh, that money then to be distributed. And it is distributed, of course, some of it goes to the workers in the form of wages, some of it uh, is taken away in the form of taxes. Now, I've added taxes in here because Marx very rarely dealt with taxes throughout capital, but it seemed to me very important to put that in because this is a very important part of the general circulation process. And then, but then the rest of the capital uh, and surplus value is divided amongst different f segments of capital. Some of it goes to the merchant capitalists who help with the realization process. Some of it goes to the landlords who, who own property and, and therefore can charge rent. So we have profit on merchant's capital, we have rent on land. Uh, some of it goes uh, to the finance capitalists and in return for the, their services, they receive uh, a rate of interest. So the, the, the distribution of the, of, the, of the value and the surplus value is a very distinctive moment of this circulation process. And that money which is distributed then gets uh, divided, as it were. Some of it flows back into consumption by providing the effective demand, and some of it flows uh, back into reinvestment, back into the money form, and then the whole thing starts uh, all over again. Now, the interesting thing about Marx's description of this is that also that there are certain contextual conditions uh, within which this circulation process makes. One of the things he does throughout Capital is to frequently take those contextual conditions and to sort of say, look, they're important, but I'm not going to deal with them here because investigation of them is not going to lead me to understand the very specific character of the circulation and accumulation of Capital. So what I do, he says, is to, talk, is to mention them and then pass on. For example, labor power. Labor power, when the Capital enters the market, they have to find wage laborers who are willing to sell their labor power. So there always already has to be uh, a, a, a thriving uh, wage labor structure. And that means that la wage labor has to be reproduced somehow. So there is social reproduction occurring. Now Marx looks at this and says, well, uh, yeah, this is important and clearly the capitalist has to provide enough value to the laborer so that they, provide, they have enough means to, to reproduce themselves. Uh, but I'm not going to actually talk about that process very much, he said, because actually what I'm going to try to do is to give you the idea of what capital does. And capital doesn't really care about social reproduction. It actually says, basically, here's the money, you get on with it and you do it. And so Marx kind of says, I, 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 this, is what I, this is how I'm going to treat it. Social reproduction is a very important and key aspect of this. It's a free good that capitalists are going to utilize, uh, but we've just given the laborer the money and let them get on with the reproduction process. So I'm not going to consider that further here. Now clearly, a lot of work needs to be done on the question of social reproduction and the social reproduction of labor power. And a lot of work has been done, and of course, particularly by feminists and so on, talking about household labor, household structures, and things of that kind. Uh, and all of which is, I think, very important to add into what Marx has to say. But Marx takes the view that this is not productive of value. This is doing a service, creating a context within which value can circulate. And this is the way in which he treats of this. So he doesn't actually go into this in the kind of detail that many people think he should, uh, should have done. Behind this reproduction of labor power, however, lies something else, which is uh, a lot of uh, ideas about human capacities and powers and, and, and the history of productivity of labor and how that history has been worked out and, and, and its long, long history. And so Marx refers again to this but says, well, you know, 
this is an important uh, aspect of the dynamics of this system, but I'm going to treat uh, whatever that historical legacy is as a set of free goods, free goods from human nature, free goods of cultural capacities and powers, free gift gifts of culture, of, uh, uh, of, of the like. And, and that, again, is a very important context in which the circulation and accumulation of capital occurs. But again, Marx says, I'm not going to consider it in great detail here, except uh, with a, a number of spe very specific kind of questions. For example, if you go a little bit further up in the diagram, you see that uh, effective demand and, and, and the realization process depends very much uh, upon the wants, needs, and desires of a population. And in volume one of Capital, in the third chapter, Marx talks about the fact that wants, needs, and desires have to be created. And he makes very clear, if wants, needs, and desires are not there, then no value is produced. So that the value which is produced in production is potentially produced, and it's only realized when it's gone through the moment of circulation or the moment of realization. And this, therefore, means that, uh, as he pointed out, there's a contradictory unity within the circulation process, taken as a totality, between production and realization. You, if you have production, he says, uh, uh, production creates value, circulation realizes it. And without the two moments, the whole system cannot break down. So you have to look at that contradictory unity between production and realization. But realization depends very much on having a population that wants, needs, and desires certain commodities. And how are those wants, needs, and desires orchestrated and organized so that they actually meet the requirements of the capitalist who is producing commodities? And there is, uh, throughout the history of capitalism, a long, long history of the creation of new wants, needs, and desires. And, uh, you know, most of us here, uh, you know, 15 years ago, if somebody said you want, need, and desire a cell phone, we wouldn't have known what you're talking about. But now, of course, everybody has them, so there's wants, needs, and desires for cell phones, and wants, needs, and desires for things. So how, how does capital create that? And it's very easy to think of this, of course, well, it's all about advertising, but no, it's, it's far deeper than that. Uh, I think about the way in which wants, needs, and desires were created in the United States through the suburbanization of the United States after World War II. This was the creation of a whole environment. And to live in that environment, you needed an automobile. Uh, to be a good citizen in that environment, you needed a lawnmower. Uh, and on and on and on and on. And so actually there was a whole creation of wants, needs, and desires in a population through the reconfiguration of the environment in which people lived and the qualities of daily life. And that therefore, uh, we cannot ignore the question of wants, needs, and desires. And, and this whole kind of thing then becomes very significant, as, as Marx points out in his little chapter that, you know, he says, you know, commodities are in love with money, but, you know, and this is his Shakespearean moment, but uh, the true course of true love never did run smooth. So there is a moment here where if there's not wants, needs, and desires, then capital sinks. And therefore there is a battle always being waged by capital to try to create new wants, needs, and desires. And, and that is actually a terribly important part of capital's history. But Marx talks about this in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts. He talks about it at some length in the Grundrisse. But then in Capital, it tends to disappear by saying, actually, I'm going to assume, he says, that all commodities sell at their value. That is, I'm going to assume there's no problem of realization. And in both volumes one and two, he assumes there is no problem of realization. Every, all commodities exchange at their value, he says, in both of these volumes. Which means that he doesn't have to get into the question of how you create wants, needs, and desires. He have, doesn't have to deal with those things. He can assume it away. But nevertheless, the contextual condition is that capital has to create cultures. It has to create cultural configurations. If there is a cultural configuration there that doesn't fit with wants, needs, and desires of the circulation of capital, capital has to destroy it. So it will destroy indigenous cultures, it will tr tr destroy tradition, it will destroy those things at the same time as it creates, and it sustains, and does all those kinds of things. So there's a complicated relationship between the inner circulation process that I'm looking at here, 
which is the red mm, between the, the red points, and what's going on in the outer area, production and, and, and reproduction and destruction of one's needs and desires, of cultures, of human nature. And this is, I think, again, an important kind of issue. And you know, one of the things that I, I then do is to start to say, well, each one of these points actually has a, is, is a point of struggle. And it's not, that easy, it's not easy for capital to create new wants and needs and desires. It's actually quite, quite, a, quite a problem for it. Uh, and, and a lot of effort has to be put uh, to do it. And there's a lot of struggles which take place in this terrain. People don't like their culture being destroyed. They don't like uh, their traditions being undermined. They don't like... So there's a lot, of, a lot of fighting which goes on in this area. And actually, if you take it a bit further, in this area, we're having a very interesting debate in the United States right now. What, what, what does it mean to be an American, and an American citizen? What kind of values do we, we, do we have? I mean, everybody looks at Trump and says, is that a model citizen? Is that who we want to be like? And there's actually an interesting kind of debate beginning to emerge, which is located in this outer region of uh, wants, needs, and desires, and, what, and, and, and the nature of, uh, of, of species being, if you want to call it that, uh, which is being forged and formed uh, on the, in, in this process uh, of circulation of, of capital, and what's the relationship between the circulation of capital and the creation of a new sense of species being. Uh, is the neoliberal political subject something which is a, a recent creation? Is it different from the Fordist kind of uh, personality that Gramsci described? In what ways are these transformations in, in personal life and personal values and all the rest of it also part and parcel of the totality of what we are, with what we are looking, about, looking at? So these contextual conditions also carry on when we look at the bottom of this segment, when we kind of talk about the relation to nature. We have also the problem of the production and reproduction and destruction of uh, the natural environment in which we live. Again, here too, there are struggles going on and forms of struggle, just as there are in the field of social reproduction. So all over this map, if you like, of the totality, you find different forms of struggle which uh, exist, and different forms of, of political activism that, that, that exist. So that you will find uh, over the question of you know, climate change, habitat destruction, uh, destruction of uh, species, species loss, and all those kinds of things, a whole kind of set of movements which are actually challenging to some degree the power of capital which necessarily, in various ways, is going to be transformative in relationship to the production of nature and the destruction of nature. So that these questions, therefore, are part and parcel of the totality. Marx talks about the metabolic relation to nature. Several points, he kind of says, capital tends to destroy it. But he doesn't analyze it in great detail. But it's part of the totality that he invokes in volumes and the various volumes of capital. And, and this is true also of the question of the, of the personality of the capitalists, the personality of the workers, the, the knowledge of the workers, the understandings of the workers and the like, and the questions of social reproduction, of course, and household labor and all of those things. These are all part and parcel of the totality, but they are, they are things that Marx does not pay very close attention to. What he does pay close attention to, however, is the way in which this, if you like, this inner process of movement from production through realization and distribution and then reinvestment. So those moments become terribly important to look at as sequential to each other. But then it's interesting to look at this diagram and say, actually, there's th one of the things that's really interesting here is that the three volumes of capital map onto this almost exactly. Volume one is all about the first big red box. It's all about production process. Uh, it starts with money capital and it goes through the production process and it takes you up to the point of realization and then Marx makes the assumption. He says, I assume all commodities exchange at their value, therefore I don't have to go into the question of realization. I'm not interested in the question of realization. And that is, that's the end of the story of Volume 1. So Volume 1, then, is one, 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 one segment. And, of course, it's a fantastic investigation of that piece of the totality. 
under the assumption that there is no problem of realization, and he's also explicit about there is no problem of distribution. Actually, you read whole of volume one and you won't find, except in the chapters on primitive accumulation, the figure of the landlord. You won't find the extraction of land rent. You'll find very little about, about you know, interest and banking and, and, and the like. And you'll find very little about, uh, uh, about merchant capital. You find very little about the, the theory of distribution in general. So that Marx in volume one then creates an, uh, an isolated sliver of the totality and analyzes it as if all the rest of it is working in a perfect kind of way. Now, you can criticize Marx for doing that. My view is you don't criticize him for doing it. What you do is to say, we often have to make assumptions in order to investigate in great detail uh, some aspect of the system we're looking at. Where the problem arises is because later on people come along and say, oh, yeah, volume one is all there is. That's the only thing he published. That's the only thing we have to t look at. And besides, volume two is boring and volume three, so I'm just going to stick with volume one. <laughs> so you get, you get that kind of reaction and suddenly you get a volume one reading of, 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 of Marx's totality, which is only that sliver under these assumptions. Now in volume two, what Marx does is actually to look at the second red box, the realization process. But he does it in a very peculiar way. And the very peculiar way is that in volume two, he also assumes that there is no problem of realization. He also assumes that there is no way in which uh, the value of the commodity will deviate from its true value. All commodities in volume two sell at their value. This is a very strong assumption and a very peculiar one because he's going to be looking at the market. He also assumes in volume two that there's no technological change. Well, of course, volume one is all about technological change. Huge amounts of discussion of technological change. But volume two, he says, I assume there is no technological change. And he also says, I also assume that nothing's going on in the realm of distribution that's going to screw things up. I'm just going to analyze it. So, he's, so his tactic in volume two is very strange. And it, 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 it bothered me for a while to think about why is it that Marx assumes that all commodities exchange at their, their value. Therefore, you're not going to actually get into the question of where does the effective demand come from and all those sorts of questions. You tend to sort of lay those to one side. And the answer, I think, lies in this. That in volume three of Capital, Marx shows that commodities can never exchange at their value. In fact, they exchange at their prices of production, what he calls their prices of production. That the value of a commodity is set by the equalization of the rate of profit. So the, va the true value of a commodity is the, the constant capital, C, plus the variable capital, which is the value of labor power, V, plus the surplus value. That's the true value. The market value, after the equalization of the rate of profit, is that the value of the commodity is C, the constant capital, V, the variable capital, plus the average rate of profit, which is not the same, of course, as surplus value. So in volume three, he says things change. Now, he had to say in volumes one and two that he was going to assume that all commodities exchanged at their value because he knew damn well they didn't in volume three. And in volume three, we are going to find this as a variable problem. But that led him into a very peculiar tactic in volume two, which was to say, all right, I'm going to assume everything's in equilibrium. Then what I do is instead of, is I go backwards to look at all of the conditions which would sustain that equilibrium. So it's a sort of ass backward way of investigating the whole kind of problem. Instead of investigating all of the elements and then seeing what they produce, he assumes the presumption is an equilibrium in demand and supply, and then that, that equilibrium in demand and supply requires all of the uh, elements uh, of, and he's very, very interested in volume two on questions of things like turnover time, fixed capital circulation, the circulation of uh, you know, temporal different temporalities. How do you put these things together so that you get an equilibrium in the market when there are completely different temporalities? 
It takes a, you know, you've got an annual crop coming in and you've got cotton factories that need a certain amount of cotton each day. How does that all come together and what temporality gets sorted out? How does fixed capital work? And how does that circulate? These are all sorts of questions. And then he puts a macro program in at the end. And there in the macro program, he kind of says, well, uh, in order for there to be equilibrium, what we see is a certain ratio of production of means of production versus production of wage goods or luxury goods also at certain point. What we see is uh, uh, something of this kind. And here you understand why he had to assume there was no technological change, because if there was technological change, it would be dis disruptive of those equilibrium conditions right the way on. So in order to maintain the equilibrium, uh, he uh, eliminates any kind of technological change, although there is a funny little quirky thing that happens in the reproduction schemas where he introduces a bit of technological change, because that's the only way he can balance everything uh, in an expanding uh, accumulation process. So Volume 1 d does something about production. Volume 2 is an, a, an incomplete and very peculiar kind of exploration of the realization process. But what these lead to is some very, very different conclusions as to what the nature of capital is about. In the Volume 1 story, what we find in the general law of capital accumulation is that we produce an expanding geographical kind of, uh, expanding uh, system, and the expansion of the system uh, requires that, of course, you have more labor power and uh, you employ more laborers and, uh, and all the rest of it. And, but on the other hand, what we also see is that capital is in command of the technology and can produce unemployment and can produce an industrial reserve army. Capital has an interest, given what is laid out in Volume 1, in a solid uh, continuing assault upon the, the living standards of the working class so that it can extract more and more surplus value through absolute surplus value and then relative surplus value. So this is what is going on in Volume 1 of Capital. And the result comes when he, Marx talks about the consequence of all of this is that there is an immense concentration of wealth at the top of the scale, and there is an immense deficit of well-being and, and, and degradation of living conditions uh, at the, the other the end of the social scale, that of the working class. In other words, the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. This was a very, very important finding for Marx because it actually refuted, of course, the Adam Smith notion that uh, give us a free market economy, and then that will redound to the benefit of all. Marx kind of says, you take a free market economy and what it's going to do left to itself is it's going to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And you're going to get increasing rates of exploitation of the working people. So this is the kind of conclusion that comes from Volume 1 of Capital. Now, it's always been interesting teaching this because, you know, at some point or other people would say, well, you know, it's not really the case. I mean, my dad's a worker and and, and actually, we have two cars in the driveway, and we have a suburban house, and, uh, and all the rest of it. This is, a, you know, this story Marx tells is, is a pure fiction. So you then found yourself saying things like, well, go off to Bangladesh or Shenzhen and look at what's going on there, and you'll see that Marx is kind of, there's something true, there's a certain truth to Marx's story, but you've then got the problem of what to do about the affluent working classes. And, and they don't, they're, not, they're not explained to you at all in Volume 1, but in Volume 2 they are. Because by the time you get to volume end of, end of Volume 2, Marx is kind of saying, you know, if you drive the wage rate down and reduce the, 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 the share of wages in national income more and more and more, as of course has happened, if you do that, then you've got a problem in the market. You, you, make, you, make, you, you, the, you make the realization impossible. You maximize the conditions of production of surplus value and undermine the capacity to realize the value. So in Volume 2, you get a completely different story. In Volume 2, Marx starts saying, you know, look, uh, there are all sorts of reasons why you get crises. One of them is the tendency of capital to keep on reducing wages and, and all the rest of it through competition and, and, and the like. So, so, so what we have to do is to match and say, well, these two stories don't fit each other. Is Marx contradicting himself or is he talking about a contradiction of capital? And my answer to that is, you know, he's talking about a contradiction of capital. 
When it does well on a volume one story, then it does badly on a volume two story. Basically, I make the argument that after 1945, the world was organized in a capitalist, in a capitalist way, but it was, ca it was organized around a volume two story. That is, there was an attempt to manage demand in such a way and create, uh, uh, to some degree, affluent workers who could actually buy the automobiles that Henry Ford was producing in masses and, 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 and live in the suburbs that were being produced and, and, and all the rest of it. So the volume two story actually served very well to explain something like the suburbanization boom and all of the production of wants, needs and desires that went on uh, in, that, in that kind of period, including the ideology you know, of, of all of the, the TV soap operas, I Love Lucy, The Brady Bunch, all those kinds of things which were celebrating the suburban lifestyle and making everybody think that's where the American dream is, is located. So we have all of that going on and that's kind of volume two sort of story. And Marx talks at the end, very briefly, of uh, uh, Volume 2, about the notion of rational consumption. Rational consumption, that is, from the standpoint of the working class. Not, not sorry, rational consumption from the standpoint of the capitalist class. What is rational for capital? And what must be created? R how rational consumption must be, must, must be absolutely managed? <coughs> so Volume 1 tells one story, Volume 2 tells another story. Of course, the Volume 2 story, as it applied in the 1960s and so on, led to the empowerment of labor and labor became much stronger and so capital decided to crush labor and go into a Volume 1 story. It was very interesting teaching capital in those years. When I was teaching capital in 1970, I had a hard time making sense of all of this stuff about the Industrial Reserve Army and all this kind of stuff. Really hard time because, you know, there was a welfare state, there was, you know, all kind of stuff like that. By the time you get to the middle of the 1990s, you could go to the New York Times and read stuff about employment conditions in Indonesia or the Philippines or Mexico and the Maquila zones and this kind of stuff. And it was right out of the volume one story. And at that point, I'm kind of going, see? You know, hi history, history, is, history is caught up with, uh, with volume one. The, you know, the capitalists have gone back to the volume one to story. And, and, it, you know, and this is a very crude generalization, but it's a useful way to kind of say how these two volumes position themselves in relationship to the dynamics and the dialectics of the, the contradictory unity between production and, uni and, 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 and realization and bring you to a point where you can see that capital is going to produce one thing or the other. And of course, since the 1970s, the share of wages in national income has gone down and down and down. Uh, and uh, then that's created certain problems in the market, and uh, here's something interesting, because in volume two, Marx again and again and again comes across certain problems which can't be resolved without resort to the credit system. And it's very annoying, actually, when you're reading volume two, because he says, of course, this all looks different when you introduce the credit system, but I can't deal with that here because that's in volume three. <laughs> so you've got to wait for volume three. So one of the things I did in the companion to volume, to volume two of Capital is to take all the stuff about the credit system in volume three and put it into volume two and say, look, every time he says that, go and read the stuff about, the, you know, so, so you put the, 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 the things together. This is, this is, is interesting because, you know, in many ways, what, what has saved capitalism since uh, the 1970s or so has been an increase in debt that actually the one of the ways in which you rounded the circle of, of the fact that you're making labor less and less uh, uh, a viable kind of market uh, is to you know, create credit cards and, and consumer debt and all the rest of it. So the whole system then actually moves to a volume three story, which is the creation of, of debt and, 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 and all the rest of it. So the volume one and volume two stories are, I think, uh, interesting and exciting to, to put together. They actually also uh, suggest, again, just to come back to the whole kind of question of the forms of social struggle. Obviously, the question of production uh, and, and volume one is very much about the classic labor capital struggle. And we know, you know, and I, I can go into that if you like, and I'm, I'm not going to diminish in any way the significance of that struggle and the nature and what it's about, the struggle in the labor process. Uh, the fact that the, the worker is, an, is, is the center of anti-capitalist ideology and, and anti-value uh, strategies. 
the, all, 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 the, all the things that go on around the value of labor power and all the rest of it. So there are lots of things of this sort which, which are very significant in volume one about the nature of the struggle. But the trouble is when Marx said, okay, I'm going to assume everything exchanges at its value and I therefore don't have to talk about realization, is that he actually cut out some very important uh, aspects of struggle. I've already suggested. There are struggles over wants, needs and desires. But there are struggles also that go on around realization. But when Marx did talk about those struggles, and he talked about them about three times, once in the Communist Manifesto and twice in Volume 3 of Capital, when he did talk about them, he pointed out something very important. He said, the nature of these struggles is not between capital and labor. These struggles are about buyers and sellers. And that therefore, when you look at what's happening at the point of realization, you'll find huge struggles going on uh, which, which in which pit buyers against sellers. And those struggles are around things like one of the big issues we have had in the United States and continue to have is the prices of pharmaceutical drugs. What happens is when some hedge fund comes in and buys up the patent for a, a, a certain drug and, and then uh, it was, was costing $7.50, but he decides he's going to market it for $750 a pill. Nothing. Nothing to stop them. They can do it. And they do it. This is stealing. Okay, this is robbery. This is accumulation by dispossession, which is going on at the point of realization. In other words, there are in very intense struggles which form. But notice this. If, that, if that's what happens to the drug prices, it's not only workers who get affected by that, middle class people get affected by it, even upper class people get affected by it, except that if you have good insurance, then the insurance company pays. And if the insurance companies pay, then what happens is all insurance premiums go up. And everybody wonders why insurance premiums in the United States in medical care are so huge. The answer is you don't control drug prices and you're not down, so actually you have to cover all of these exorbitant, crazy kind of drug pricing practices which exist at the point of realization. And actually when you suddenly start to look at daily life issues in the community, they're all at the point of realization. That and, I, and, and, and it's questions of, you know, uh, question, you know, questions of housing, for example. Realization of, 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 of housing. So, so I think there's a problem with the fact that Marx actually excluded uh, the whole kind of discussion, detailed discussion of realization, even though, like some of the other points about metabolic relation to nature, he says very directly in the Grundry, so you cannot understand capital as a totality unless you recognize the contradictory unity between production and realization. And you've got to do that. And if you don't recognize that, and actually then you go back to the first section of Volume 1 of Capital, and he says, if the capitalist takes a good to market and nobody wants it, there is no value. So actually the whole kind of question of the recirculation of value rests on that product, contra uh, contradictory unity of production and realization. Now volume three then <coughs> is all about the realization, is, is all about the distribution of capital. And I've already mentioned the distribution of the, of the value and the surplus value between individual capitalists depends on the equalization of the rate of profit, which means that commodities exchange not at their values, but according to prices of production. These are not market prices, by the way. These are values, but it's a different value structure. Now, if that is the case, then there are certain transfers of value occurring. And in fact, what this means is that value flows from labor-intensive sectors towards capital-intensive sectors. That is, there's a redistribution of value that goes on through the market. And that redistribution of value has the form, what Marx jokingly kind of says, this is, this is the form of capitalist communism. It's from each capitalist according to the labor they employ to each capitalist according to the capital they advance. That's the principle. And there's a redistribution. When you go on further and start looking at what he's saying in Volume 3, this is also true about transfers between nations. When you've got one nation which has a lot of labor-intensive industries and you have high-tech 
capital intensive industries somewhere else and they trade with each other, then what happens is you get a, co a, a transfer of value from the, 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 the labor intensive economies to the capital intensive economies. But Marx says something very interesting about that transfer of value. He says it doesn't go to the whole country. It goes to a certain class. Guess which one? <laughs> and, and actually, this is a terrific kind of way to start to look at many of the aspects of how the global capitalism has been working. You don't need to be an imperialist pig and go and whack people. All you need is a free market. Because <laughs> the free market will redistribute. That's what the free market does, it redistributes. That's why we have all this free market rhetoric going around, you know, and free trade and all this kind of stuff. Because then value gets transfers from, bang you know, when from Bangladesh to, to the United States. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that actually comes out of uh, uh, all of this discussion in Volume 3. But there is uh, the other aspects of it, and I don't have time to go into great detail about this, but let me just give you one aspect of it, which I think is crucial and critical. Um, the Chinese uh, take the view, at least uh, uh, from some of the reading I've done, some of them take the view, that one of the most significant dates in capital's history was August the 15th, 1971. Because on that date, Nixon took the dollar away from the gold standard. Now, throughout the history of capital before that, gold had always been the money commodity which was in the background always, and increasingly in the background of the 1920s and 1930s to international trade. And Marx had always made the argument that value is only recognized on the world market and the world market only works when there's world money, and there is only one form of world money for Marx, and that was gold. So, we went off the gold standard. Then what happened was there was no disciplining of the money supply, and that's one of the reasons we went off gold, was, was you know, because the, the, the bankers never liked the gold standard because it restricted their speculative activities too much. Also, the world was recognized that the United States, which guaranteed the price of gold at $35 an ounce, was having a real hard time living up to that, and more and more countries were taking their money out in gold from Fort Knox. So by the time you get to about 1971, there's hardly any gold left in Fort Knox. Uh, everybody's taking it out, so the, the point of being on the gold standard for the United States was disappearing. So, the United States goes off the gold standard, and monetary system of the world is opened up then. Now, why would the world then accept that the US dollar be the global reserve currency? That was one of the big questions. And politically, there were a couple of things happened that were absolutely crucial. One is the United States threatened to go to war with Saudi Arabia unless they recycled all of the money that they were getting from the oil price hike back to the New York investment banks. That's the first thing that happened. Second thing that happened was the, the United States insisted with the Saudis and other Gulf states that all oil contracts be, in oil, be specified in, oil, in, in dollars. So the petrodollar then became the reserve currency and the United States was going to preserve its position as of seniorage of the world currency by going into, by, by, this, by these, these sort of tactics. Now, at this point, however, there was no way in which there was any stabilizing force underneath you know, the production of, of money. People would print money. The US had been printing money like crazy during the 1960s and 1970s, and, and therefore we start to see this grand inflation occurring. I mean, the inflation at the end of the 1970s was up around 20%, 17% uh, in, in Britain and, 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 the, and, and the US. Interest rates had to go up to 16 17%. Uh, to, to, de to deal with this. So there was a kind of tremendous kind of period of difficulty. That period of difficulty was resolved by the crystallization out of what I call the state finance nexus, and other people have called it other things, but basically it's the way in which Wall Street gets together with the Treasury Department of the United States via uh, the Federal Reserve 
and they form this kind of governing body, if you like, of, of, of what's going on in the monetary structures of the, of the world, backed up, of course, by the IMF and, and all the rest of it. Now, the Chinese interpretation is then, this allowed all kinds of things to happen where people could rob the world of value through financial manipulation. The classic individual case of this was George Soros, who in 1992, I think it was, bet against the British pound in the exchange rate mechanism. You know, Major had committed the British to remain at a certain level, and there was a lot of pressure on it. And it was clear that uh, the Bank of England was having a hard time propping up the pound against the Deutsche Mark, and that something was likely to crack. So George Soros bought uh, and borrowed as many pounds as he possibly could, billions, and turned them all into Deutsche Marks, which of course forced the currency of British pound down even further. And eventually, you know, it happened a day when uh, they, they tried to raise the interest rate two times in a day, nothing happened. They couldn't maintain it, and they had to devalue. So then George Soros took all of the uh, Deutschmarks that he'd bought and he put them back into pounds at a you know, much higher rate and he got a huge amount of money out of this. He made about a billion uh, in, in you know, just two days trading. Well, if you can make a billion in two days trading, why the bother would you bother and go and make cars and things like that? You know? and, and, and actually, uh, the, the reason I, did, I use this example was because this sort of stuff was going on all over the place in, in different forms and different ways. But then you kind of say, well, what, if he made a billion, whose billion was it that he stole? And the answer is the British government or actually the British taxpayer. In other words, this was a form of robbery of the a mass of the, the British population, all ending up. It's what I call the classic form of accumulation by dispossession that was taking place within the financial thing. And the Chinese kind of say, this, this is what capital came about after, the uh, after going off the gold standard. And this is what they did to Mexico, of course, in 1982, and this is what they did to other things. They've done, lot, they've done it again and again. This is what they did to East and Southeast Asia. They did it to the Thai baht and then the Indonesian rupee, and then they did it to the Korean wong. They, they, they've been robbing the world systematically through these mechanisms and, mechani and, 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 and the like. And the Chinese look at this, and it's very interesting, because basically they say, you know, we're the next ones in line if we open our capital markets. But we're not going to open our capital markets. We're going to sit there and actually refuse. And so, you know, all this attack upon the Chinese about how you're not, you know, your currency manipulators, blah, 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 you know, all kinds of pusher, pressure on them to open their capital markets. And they all kind of say, the, the Chinese kind of say, yeah, we're trying, you know, we really are trying very hard, you know, but it doesn't quite kind of sort of work, things don't work quite like that, you know, and we're trying and we'd like to be a market economy, but we can't quite get there, you know, so. <laughs> because they know that they're, they're next in line, uh, although the Chinese are fortunate because they have a huge debt, but their huge debt <coughs> is actually in their own currency. So they, they're protected, as it were, from the sorts of things that happen to uh, many, most other countries because they're not designated in, the debt is not designated in dollars. And interestingly, the Chinese now are negotiating oil contracts not in dollars. The last big oil contract negotiated between China and Russia uh, was in local currencies. And, and in fact, what the Chinese are also doing is setting up a gold market in Shanghai and beginning to accumulate gold. You can see what is going on here, which is to some degree the Chinese are playing the game of saying, well, we are actually s positioning ourselves to at some point or other mount a challenge being the global reserve currency because we're going to be much more stable than the US. And it's going to be much more stable than the US dollar and of course the euro is a disaster for all sorts of reasons, as we know. So, this is a volume three story. And this volume three story indicates something that's terribly, terribly important to me. It is that one of the, one of the main things that's animating the global capitalism right now is the creation and circulation of debt. Now, debt is a claim on future labor. You are making a claim on a future and that future is foregone. 
In other words, a lot of what happens in the global economy right now is people struggling to redeem their debts. And actually, when you look at student populations, and this happens at individual level, personal level, you know, your life is foregone, you know, you've already, you've already incurred the debt. This debt peonage. And, and actually, if you look at the volumes of debt which are going on in the world, then you have an incredible increase everywhere. And that has occurred particularly since 1970, which means actually that the circulation of interest-bearing capital starts to become even more important than it ever was. And it's become a powerful force within the global economy in its own right. Now, when you look at this diagram, you ask yourself, where's the driving force in this diagram? Volume one would say, it's the individual entrepreneur who's looking to gain a, 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 a profit. Volume two would say, if there's a problem of demand, then we've got to find some way to manage demand, and state expenditures becomes one of the ways to manage demand, so we do it through welfare state, we do it, you know, it's a Keynesian kind of story, if you like, volume two, which, which is, by the way, one of the problems, because if you want to talk a lot about volume two, people look at you and say, oh, you're a Keynesian. <laughs> you kind of go, well, you know, no, actually, Keynes came after Marx. <laughs> and, and I think took quite a lot from, from, from this, particularly the, the, the reproduction schemas. So, so but the, the third volume, the driving force is the search for the redemption of debt. And it turns out that there are a lot of organizations that have massive amount of money, have, that have a fiduciary of responsibility to try to maximize the return on the money they hold. For instance, private pension funds. They all sit up there and they are required to maximize their rate of return. That is, they become the drivers. They go out and they kind of say, oh God, you know, go and do something so that I can lend you money to get my 8% you know, rate of return uh, on, on, the, on, on the pension fund money. Do, you know. So there's a push of this sort. <coughs> and they try to inveigle all kinds of people into sort of you know, getting debt financed. Oh, this would be great, you know. So there's a game, game being played. So the... the Th this then becomes a very, very significant aspect of the nature of the economy. And the big question arises here is, who is able to struggle against this? What kind of struggle exists here? Between whom and about what? I think this is, again, one of the questions that is, is surrounding us right now. How do we struggle against the Federal Reserve? How do we, how do we struggle against the state finance nexus and the power of the state finance nexus? We know about, you know, that vampire squid Goldman Sachs, who does God's work, as they say, because, and this is the Matthew principle, you know, he that hath shall have it taken away, and, the, the, you know, all of that, and he that hath not shall have it taken away even, work, even more. Yeah, this is, this is the, the, the Goldman Sachs logo. Very biblical. So I kind of, I, I, I think that what we need do is start to think about the totality of the system and start to think about exactly what is happening dynamically within the world economy. There are many aspects of this system that I think we need to take into consideration. One of the things I do in the book is spend a great deal of time talking about what I call anti-value. Debt is a form of anti-value. And anti-value gets mobilized so that value has to be produced to go against it. Now, when you say anti-value and value, people always kind of look at you and say, that's a crazy idea. And you say, well, actually, you know, the physicists, when they talk about the world, they can only talk about matter and antimatter. And actually, Marx was talking about value and anti-value all the way through. And debt becomes the, para, you know, the, the, the real major form because it's reducing people to debt peonage. It's not about emancipation and freedom. It's about inculcating debt peonage so that the system can survive, because the only way the system can survive is through an accumulation of debts. This system, and this is why it's so different from the hydrological cycle, is not a cycle. It is, as Marx says, a spiral. 
It's a spiral. And we have a very interesting English expression, things spiral out of control. Actually, capital is spiraling out of control. But where it is spiraling out of control is in a very different way than a lot of the left thinks of. A lot of the left, obviously, enamored of volume one, because it's such a brilliant and wonderful book, doesn't understand that actually the big fights now are elsewhere within this system. They are at points of realization. How many of the large movements that have occurred in the world over the last 15 years have been about questions of realization, not questions of production? Gezi Park, the Brazil uprisings of uh, 2013. You know, even in our, in our own case, you know, this, this, the, the, the stories that are, that, are, that are going occupy. So actually, what we have to do is to start to match the theoretical framework that we're setting, uh, setting up and exploring with what is going on on the ground and why it's going on on the ground the way it's going. Now I have a lot of things I could sort of get into here and I have some extra slides I'm not going to bother you with, but well, maybe I will. <laughs> I just go quickly. Here's, here, here, for example, is uh, if I can. Hmm? This one. Oh. Okay. This is the this is the total debt uh, in the United States. That's personal, uh, corporate, and state debt. Look what it's done since 1970. It had a little hiccup around 2007, 2008, and then resumed. That's a classic kind of thing. Uh, this is a picture of Chinese debt. The Chinese actually saved global capitalism in 2007, 2008 by launching a huge developmental project. And look at the debt as it soared. Now it's now up at getting close to 250% of GDP. The bottom one kind of says an interesting one. If you lend money, if you lend money to developers to, to build cities, you need to lend money uh, to consumers to, to, inv to invest in housing. So the bottom is a rapid increase in the uh, debt uh, encumbrance of uh, Chinese consumers. Now this is an interesting one. This is what happens on the ground. The blue line at the bottom is the consumption of cement in the United States. The red line is the consumption of cement in China. <laughs> As you see, there's a little bit of a difference between them. <laughs> As you see, the Chinese managed in about three years to consume about 45% more cement than the United States consumed in 100 years. What does that do to the environment? What does that do? You know, I mean, this is, a, this, uh, this is a sort of catastrophic thing. And it's not only cement you get this sort of thing going on. Look at world steel production. How much China took it up, suddenly sent it surging. Look, this is copper production. Look at the Chinese production of copper. And, and use of copper. And here's a very interesting thing, because the Chinese, uh, uh, of course, used a lot of foreign investment. And the solid line, the, 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 the dotted line along, which goes along like, is, is foreign direct investment coming into. The dashed line at the bottom is foreign investment going out. And it actually, right now, of course, China is investing in the rest of the world at a huge rate. It has surplus c capacity. And, and we're seeing it. Where is it going? Well, we, s we, we see. A lot of it is going to this one belt, one road project. This is the sort of, uh, if we, this is, this is what it was about uh, four years ago. This is what the flows are now. You can see a very rapid uh, transformation. This is an interesting kind of map of foreign investments in Chi of, of the Chinese abroad in 2003. You see, not too much, 2003. 2015, foreign investments, what are the Chinese doing? They're pretty much everywhere right now. This is you know, a spatial fix gone crazy. And this too, it comes out of the, what I would call the, the expansion, the, the, the spiraling out of control, which is a spatial as well as a temporal kind of phenomena. So just leave those thoughts with you, um, but I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, without further uh, delay, we uh, open the floor to questions from the audience. When you ask your question, uh, please do raise your hand and wait for the roving mic to arrive. Please uh, do identify yourself, telling us your name and your affiliation. And please do ask a question rather than delivering your own lecture. Thank you. <laughs> right, so we'll take a, a few questions, uh, two or three questions at one go, uh, and let uh, David respond. So we'll take uh, well, one starting from, from the top, uh, the first row on the left, and then maybe one from the bottom, from the second row over here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I had a question which was about what you were saying at the end um, when you were talking about um, the different struggles around realisation. Um, and uh, you t mentioned Occupy, mentioned Gezi. Um, some things that were kind of missing from the list were uh, the um, struggles against police violence and the struggles um, the the riots in that happened in the UK a few years ago. I know that you wrote somewhat disparagingly about those struggles um, at the time, um, but uh, it seemed like from what you said, um, uh, there was a good reason to take them seriously, um, which was that the the um, you know as you said, if you take a good to market and nobody wants it, then no value is realized. If you take a good to market and somebody steals it, then also no value is realized. It's a kind of direct attack on the commodity form, which requires, as you've like emphasized, this um, circulation. Um, so uh, I guess I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that. Are you wanting still to dismiss these struggles or do you want to incorporate them into your story? Okay, maybe get one more question. Um, yeah, thanks very much for coming along. Um, there was a book that came out a couple of years ago now called Inventing the Future um, by Alex Williams and Nick Cerniak that talked about, uh, basically advocated that a successful left politics today has to be about claiming uh, automation and universal basic income from the perspective of the left. I wonder if you thought that was possible or desirable. Do we have to take a go at that? Okay, yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm, you know, the universal basic income discussion is, is interesting. It's, uh, it's supported, of course, by some people on the left. It's also a, a, a love-in project from Silicon Valley, uh, which also wants a universal basic income, so people will have enough money to subscribe to Netflix and sit on a, <laughs> sit on a couch and just die from... <laughs> It was what we call in the United States death by Netflix. <laughs> so, so I, I, I um, uh, you know, I, I think this universal basic income uh, and so on on the left is not uh, is not going to go very far. Look, because the problem is this: for me, at the heart of the cap uh, of capitalism is the class relation. And unless you remove the class relation and transform social relations. Uh, you know, thoroughly, then no kind of technological gimmick or organizational fix is going to do any good. Um, I'm unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, lived long enough to realize that, uh, to go through several uh, phases of technological utopianism from the 1960s and 1970s and so on, and we, we're in another one now with artificial intelligence, and the fact is, Marx actually has a very good thing to say about this, about um, John Stuart Mill. He says, you know, John Stuart Mill, he says in the beginning of the chapter on, on machinery, uh, had, a, had a real problem. He couldn't understand why it was that machinery that should lighten the load of labor seemed to make the lot of the laborer worse. And he was perplexed by this. And Marx, well, says, you know, that's because he doesn't understand that the role of machinery is to extract surplus value from workers, not to lighten the load of labor. Artificial intelligence will do the same. Artificial intelligence is coming in. I think you're right to sort of say, we don't fight it like some of the things were fought against uh, the automation of manufacturing back in the 1960s, 1970s. 
because it's here. We don't fight it in that way. As, but we have to think about the social relations in which that's happening. And if there's no change in social relations, then guess what? The rich are going to get richer and the, the poor are going to get poorer, as they did from the last big wave of technological innovation in the early 1980s, when you had people like Peoria and Sable saying, all oh, the working class is going to love this flexible specialization. It's going to be great for them, you know. And what happened? Look what happened, and 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 that'll have that'll be the story all over again. So we don't, we're not we we, we we mustn't love it. We've got to you know deal with it critically. I'm not sure what I what what, what you're referring to when you say I was uh, bad you know bad mouthing certain kinds of struggles. I was probably critical if they were uh, in 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 much the same way I'm being critical uh, uh, of. Of uh, the artificial intelligence thing, if if they don't uh, go deep enough and far enough into the structures, social and political structures uh, of, of of capitalism, to really try and make a, a, a difference, uh, and I, that is the criteria which with which I tend to uh, approach. There is a lot of kind of. Um, uh, many struggles which are going on, which are very local struggles, and I guess the hope is that well, we, you, know, you can have uh, some sort of uh, socialism within one you know, village or something of this kind, but I, I'm, I'm very skeptical about the nature of those uh, struggles if they are not going to address what seem to me to be some of the real critical questions of what is powering this system and where this system is headed. <coughs> Because, you know, all sorts of things we could do. I mean, I, I get tempted to go and sort of live on the land in Argentina and say, screw it, you know, I just don't want to have any more to do with any of this nonsense. You know, and of course, with the, with the Donald Trump effect, it's, that's a considerable incentive to do exactly that. But, but I think that this, the, 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 the issue right now is the fact of growing debt peonage. You know, we should really concentrate our attention on that. Look what happened to Greece. Okay, that is in some ways it is a model for what might happen to all of us at a certain time down the road. It's already happening to Puerto Rico. Uh, they're about to get hit by another hurricane, so they get a double whammy on all of this. But Puerto Rico is in almost the same state as Greece right now, and 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 it's appalling. I mean, the whole country is basically been thrown to the dogs and said, let's get to get on with it. And, and all in the name of some kind of fiscal game, which is called austerity and, and, and is called redeeming your debts and paying off your debts, and you undertook the debts and you got the debts, you've got to redeem them. And, and, and we haven't quite got debtors' prison right now, but in many ways the Greeks have been put in debtors' prison. And it's a bit like, you know, sort of 18th century, uh, sort of debtors' prison uh, where, where, where people go, you know, so, so uh, to me, to me uh, again, the, the, yeah, I'm all in favor of a lot of these uh, of local actions, and, 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 and you know, I work with people who want community land trusts and, and, and uh, as non-market housing and things, and I'm, yeah, I'm all in favor of those sorts of things. Lots of experimentation is a good thing, and it should be supported wherever it is. But if that is all there is, and we don't take into account the fact that right now, the global debt is something like 225 or 250% of global GDP. Now, back in the 1980s, if any country had a debt more than about 70 or 80% of GDP, it was considered, a, it had to be a target for IMF intervention and, and structural readjustment. Who's going to structural, do a structural readjustment of the global economy, which is now 250 or 225% Global, global debt. And, and the, debt, the debt numbers are astonishing and what money is being made out of it. This is the other thing. I gave a talk when I was, the essence of which was, we're also in a society where money is betraying value. I mean, my, value is, you know, money is not value. Value is something that's represented. Value is a social relation, it's immaterial. But as, an, as something, and it's like power or something like that. But it needs, it it needs a representation, and the representation of value is money. But as we know, representations can lie. 
uh, you know, again, the geographical example of that is map projections. You get map projections, and some map projections are great they, for, for directions, but they're absolutely terrible on, on everything else. So, so the, you could, money is lying about value right now. And at the same time, the rich are getting richer because they are accumulating forms of wealth in the monetary form. At the same time as they're also trying to bolster their arcs by actually procuring assets. So we've got an asset kind of bubble going on all over the place, land in particular, but not only land or resources and, 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 and the like. So there's a lot of work to be done, it seems to me, in, in thinking through what the real issues, what the real issues are and what has to be done about it. And when I kind of say, who's going to take on the state finance nexus? How is it going to be disarmed? How and who's going to do it? Well, the first thing we have to do is to recognize that the state finance nexus, as I call it, is at the heart of the problem. And that therefore something has to, has to be done socially and politically to curb what is going on in terms of this global robbery. And, and that, you know, I appreciate the fact that the Chinese have understood something about global capitalism, which most capitalists don't seem to have, or most leftist uh, thinkers don't seem to have understood. Which is that, again, money is betraying value. And that this then allows massive redistributions of value by processes of robbery and thievery and, uh, and, and, and all of the things that go along with it, which allows you know, the thesauruses of this world to become ultra-rich overnight without doing anything in terms of making anything or doing anything. Perhaps we can get two, more, uh, two or three more questions. Okay, um, all right, I see more hands in the, uh, I think there was this one question over here in the third row on the left. And maybe the question on, uh, in the center, this is probably second, third row, yes, with a gray shirt. So on, start uh, from thank one. you for your uh, clear lecture. Uh, my question is mm, very simple. Could you speak up a little bit, please? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now better? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I go straight to the question. Is um, Why in the US, though there are all these uh, uh, movements you, which you were saying, you know, Occupy Wall Street and so on and so forth, and obviously there is an historical problem of social marginalization, racism and uh, social exclusion. Why there is, there's ne uh, never has been a class struggle as in uh, other parts of the world, as in South America and Europe. Is it because, if I can point out to your uh, own graph, uh, the wants, needs and desire created by uh, the capitalist culture? Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in the United States, there's an incredible, like, uh, increasing tension and a lot of kind of anger. Um, and now with what you talked about with China, it seems like there's going to be an inevitable kind of conflict between the United States and China to kind of fix these, these issues. And I'm wondering if you believe, kind of as Marx did, that an incredible kind of violent conflict is necessary to fixing these things, or if there's some sort of alternative to fixing this wealth inequality and redistribution? Let's get one more, just one more question. One last question, I think the one in the center, the second row, who has been raising hand for some time. Uh, I probably don't actually need it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to know if, I guess what I wanted to ask, like if you could sort of map something you'd written previously in the right to the city about the nature of uh, the quality of urban life becoming itself a sort of commodity, um, I suppose with what you're talking about with wants, needs, and desires, but how does the contemporary left or a leftist future that actually deals with, as you previously suggested, actual class struggles, actual class structures as they exist, uh, deal with the nature of the built environment that already exists, particularly in a place like London, which obviously everyone in this room does have enough, you know, sort of uh, expendable capital of their own to have access to, but in which the built environment is such that there are massive cloistered regions only available to the ultra rich. Yeah. What, like, I guess, what happens to that built environment, if that makes sense? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, just take the, the 
the last question. I mean, uh, this is a, one of the insane things I write about in the book a lot is the way in which uh, in recent years we've been building cities for people to invest in, uh, not uh, cities for people to live in. And those uh, investments need to be protected from street gangs and all sorts of other fears that people have and um, actually protected from hurricanes and things like that. So we've now got fantastic sort of structures going up in New York City, which are hurricane proof so that they can actually sit up there on the 80, you know, on the 30th floor and watch the biblical flood uh, come in uh, <coughs> when, uh, whenever it happens. So, yeah, I mean, we've, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, built environment which is uh, gone off in this way, although there are, of course, uh, many cities which are badly in need. I mean, Detroit and so on has plenty of uh, cheap housing if you want to go live and, 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 and work there. But uh, what, what do we do about it? Well, I, I think that at a certain point, uh, we, there has to be, a, a first off, there has to be a radical change in housing policy. I mean, people ask me, well, what should we do? And I kind of say, well, look, there's very simple radical reforms that we could think about. Uh, first off, uh, you know, I come from a world in which uh, university education was free, and it should be free again. And uh, education should not be a commodity. It should be freely available to everybody on an equal kind of basis. Uh, Health care should be free. <laughs> I mean, these 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 are these are practical kind of you know healthcare should be. I think we should uh, also have uh, basic uh, um, possibilities of uh, housing provision. Uh, we don't build. I mean, in the United States, we don't build affordable housing uh, anymore. We just build housing for people who have incomes of around ninety thousand dollars a year and call it affordable housing. So we have, to, we, we have a, there's a lot of you know, very practical things to do, and I'm very much in favor of what I call revolutionary reforms, that is, reforms which open up spaces for new things to happen. What you're going to do about all of the stuff that's been built in, you know, uh, s sort of uh, gated communities and, and, and isolate, you know, all of the kind of affluent stuff, I don't know. I mean, they can be taken over and converted. I imagine it would be an interesting project uh, to, try to, do, uh, try to do so. Um, and I think that you know, one of the things, just to, to push on to one of the other questions, uh, I think, I think the right, no, right now the, 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 the structures of repression and of social control and the militarization of the state apparatus has created a situation in which uh, it's almost unthinkable that uh, street violence is going to be a way to revolution and that we do, all we have to do is to storm the Winter Palace or the Federal Reserve Bank or the Bank of England and, well, you know, uh, that is not going to happen. And we have to think about revolution as a process, a long drawn out process, which is not impossible to imagine. Uh, one of the things that I would argue about, you know, having lived through the process of neoliberalization that took off in the sort of mid-70s and brought us to our present conjuncture, is that things do change. Mentalities change. In this case, mentalities have changed in a very negative way, in my view. But they can be changed in the other direction. And we have to start thinking about the decommodification of as much of social life as we can. We should start to think about different kinds of social relations. We have to address what I think is the other big question which is emerging, which is the fact that almost everybody at a certain level feels and senses a deep sense of alienation. That there is an alienation from nature, there's an alienation from politics, there's an alienation from the kinds of job opportunities that are available, there are alienations regarding the you know, transport systems and daily life. Um, and hardly surprisingly, alien, alienated populations act in not necessarily constructive ways. And one of the things we have to do is to actually set up uh, a political process which actually addresses questions of alienation and, and, and does it uh, as a long-term project. Because these things, 
And like I say, there's, there's not going to be any kind of one day wonder revolution. It's not going to be like Castro taking over Cuba or storming of the Winter Palace. Uh, it's going to be something which is very, very much longer. And in the same way that things change through the neoliberal era, uh, so I, it seems to me that, as I'm saying, that we can in institute a new era in which we change things in a different direction. Why has there been no class struggle in the United States? Uh, actually, there has been. There's been a lot of class struggle in the United States all over the place at various times. It's never been put together in the form of a political party, which has been a Labour Party, but to the Democratic Party up until, well, in certain periods of its life, the Democratic Party was, was, was actually uh, engaging in class politics. If you look at the reforms that occurred in the early 1970s, occupational safety and health, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, consumer, pro consumer protections. There was a whole kind of raft of incredibly progressive legislation that was passed in the United States. <laughs> consumer reforms of, 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 of banking. Tremendous kinds of, uh, and this was, was a lot to do with the class pressures that were being exercised by, by a population that was, and that was one of the reasons why we got neoliberal project to, to destroy all of that because it became uh, too, too positive and the capitalist class got very miffed uh, in the early 1970s when all of those revolutionary reforms took place and decided they would try to uh, get rid of them. So there are possibilities, but my own view would be simple things right now which can be done right now connected to the idea that this is the opening. We've got to create openings for new kinds of politics which can create new social relations. But don't imagine that there's a technological and a technological fix that's going to rescue you. Don't imagine that there's some sort of magical one bullet solution. It's going to have to be a process of attrition. What we're very good at is communicating with each other through social media. What we're not very good at is organizing. And actually organizing is really where we have to start to think about how we organize, what we organize around, and how that organizing can be actually pr project into the future with a long-term vision of what kind of community and what kind of world we want to live in. Well, it's been... It's been a great pleasure, uh, certainly for me, uh, and I'm sure for the members of the audience here to be able to listen to you, David Harvey. And also very much thank you uh, for making your time during your busy schedule to be able to, come, uh, to, be able to make your uh, talk here at the LSE. And I hope you will certainly find time again in the future to be able to come back. Yeah, sure. so thank you so much for your yeah. visit and thank for you. your talk. Thank you.